Good morning. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to the Lord's house as we begin this day together in worship. Before we begin to worship this morning, let me make you aware of several things that are happening in the life of the church that you want to be aware of, that you want to make part of your schedule, um, uh, and then and other things that you just need to know about. One of the things to know about is, is uh, the amazing job that our VBS team uh, did this past week. It was incredible, the amount of work that went into that. Um, and uh, part of the, the reason that we have for celebrating is you walk around the church this morning, you don't see any evidences of that. Uh, it means that these people know how to start a job, do a job, and finish a job. And uh, if you see someone who's involved in that, let them know uh, your great appreciation for their ministry to our children uh, and service to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're looking into your schedule, uh, a couple of things to know about this week. Uh, there will be no men at the gates uh, tomorrow morning. Um, or, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday morning with Pastor Dodds. We will have a regular Wednesday activities that will be pastorless, and we'll uh, explain that in just a few moments. But there will be an update from, uh, from Miguel D'Acevedo uh, and his ministry in Japan, and to look forward to uh, hearing uh, the video update there as part of the Wednesday night prayer meeting, along with Cata Kids and Youth Group for Young Children. Um, ladies' discipleship class happens as per usual, along with the regular prayer times. Also the Mommy and Me play date on Friday morning. Uh, I'm sorry, on uh, yeah, Friday morning at 10 a.m. at the Clarks. Uh, and then also uh, Tuesday, June 13th, will be the coffee chat um, that's going to happen at First Watch over by the shops at Greenridge. And so ladies plan on being a part of that. Uh, we do, uh, from time to time, we have to both weep and rejoice as a congregation. Uh, we are mourning the loss of Miss Audrey Price, a member you haven't seen for a few years, but she has passed. Uh, and her graveside services will be held at Oakwood Cemetery on uh, June 12th. Uh, at 11 a.m., and that's in Spartanburg. And so take note of that. And also reasons for rejoicing um, and occasions to rejoice with others. First off, announcing the birth of Providence Catherine Lee to Brendan and Alicia Kelly. Um, seven pound, nine ounce uh, baby girl this past Wednesday, and uh, you can rejoice with them. Also, opportunities to celebrate with um, a Madeline Bo Bullock for her baby shower on June 17th. Uh, and that is going to be at the Shores home. That will be at 10 a.m. that Saturday. And then also the following Sunday evening, we'll be having a pounding for Katie Rogers, celebrating her upcoming nuptials uh, with Emmanuel Henry and moving to Charlotte following that. Uh, and so uh, plan on coming, ladies, to be a part of that and, and giving encouragement um, to her. And then finally, June 25th will be the senior high graduation lunch. If you don't, that involves senior high students uh, and their families are invited to come and attend and celebrate with our seniors. Uh, we do ask you that you would pray uh, this week. Your pastors and several elders will be at General Assembly. Uh, that is in Memphis, Tennessee. And so we'll be traveling different points. Pastor Robbins has already uh, departed the area and is there uh, enjoying fellowship with uh, friends. And if you know, he went to Memphis Bible College way back. College doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. Uh, but some of the graduates do, uh, along with Pastor Robbins. And, and so he's on a mission to track them down and have fellowship with them. Uh, prior to General Assembly, along with several pastor friends. And then the others of us will be joining uh, later this, this week. So please pray for us, uh, both for our travels, but especially for the work that we do, uh, that it would be useful on behalf of our denomination. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we're delighted that you've chosen to worship with us. Uh, we would love to get to know you. There's a few ways for that to happen. Uh, if you look in front of you, there's a blue in, uh, visitor information card. It's right there in front of you in the pew rack. Uh, and you can fill that out right now. Uh, it will, uh, later on the service, we'll have an offering plate come by. A great place to drop that in is there or to find one of the pastors after the service, the few that are still around, and, and let us know you're with us. And then come join us for fellowship. We go down the hallway to the right. We have great coffee and other refreshments available for you there. And then stick around for Sunday school. Uh, it is a great way to get to know the church. It, it is the way we intentionally teach our doctrines. Pastor Dodds will be in the room behind the sanctuary back over here, and you can join him uh, for that. And then, of course, we encourage all of you, come back tonight, 6 p.m. We will close out the Lord's Day uh, in worship. Pastor King will be uh, preaching God's word to us. And then following the service, we will actually have a send-off for our beloved intern, uh, David Rios, and more importantly for his wife, Jasmine, and Lisa and Hannah, the girls. Uh, we want to say a thank you to them and goodbye. So join us for a time of fellowship uh, after the service this evening. And then as you look before you this morning, you can see that a table has been set. We will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And this is a further time for you to prepare your hearts for worship, but especially for meeting with the Lord at the table. You can ask those questions. Are you in Christ, and are you of Christ, and are you for Christ? Are you ready to be identified with Christ? 
when you come to the table. This is a time to humble yourself in his presence and to know your need for him. So as you worship this morning, do so thinking on your Lord Jesus Christ. Hear now God's call to worship from Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all your works. To begin to declare those now by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals, we'll stand together and sing hymn number 223, Thee We Adore Eternal Lord, hymn 223.
The word of God contains the law of God and it does declare to us truths about us that we must confront. Psalm 69, five says, "O God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. We know that we stand be condemned before a holy God, therefore it's right for us to confess our sins before him and to look for his forgiveness. Let's do so using the form that's printed in our bulletins. Almighty and holy God, we confess before you that we are poor sinners. We were born into a broken world, and we are prone to evil, unable of ourselves to do any good. We, by reason of our depravity, transgress without end your holy You have asked for mercy of God and he grants it to you. Hear the word of pardon from Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen. Please remain standing and turn in your Bibles for our Old Testament reading to Isaiah chapter 52. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Also, you should note in your bulletin there's a response to the reading of God's Word. Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 1. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughters of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there. Then the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now therefore what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing. Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord, and my name is blasphemed continually every day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices, they shall sing together, and they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joyful singing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear God, rear guard. And the grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Amen. Please be seated. The closing words of Paul's letter to Titus, he writes, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. 
Some translations say this in a more literal way, devote themselves to good works. And the significance is that the word there means to lead themselves, is that people will lead themselves to do those things which are good in the sight of God. They will make themselves meet urgent needs. It is a time to be intentional when we have time for the tithes and offerings to be given to the Lord, to obligate ourselves to do that which is right and good before our holy God who has done so much for us. Let's do so now. Our great God and Father, we recognize your abounding mercy towards us. We are not deserving of any of the good gifts which you have given to us, and yet you give them graciously and abundantly, even above what we could ask or think of you. And so, Lord, we pray now that it would be our intent with intentionality to give to you, to seek your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy God, remembering the words that Jesus spoke to Mary on the morning of his resurrection, we confess you as his Father and ours, his God and ours. Blessed are you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as you chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to yourself, according to your own good pleasure. Our joy this morning is that you have made us accepted in the beloved, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows. You, O oh God, are in your holy habitation. You set the solitary in families and bring those who are bound into prosperity. You have sent redemption to your people. You have commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. We come this morning to give thanks to the Lord, to call upon your name, to make known your deeds among the peoples. We have come to sing to you, to sing psalms to you, to talk of all your wondrous works, to glory in your holy name. 
We petition you this morning to expand your kingdom such that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. We look for the mountain of the Lord's house to be established on the top of the mountains and to be exalted above the hills. We pray that all nations will flow to it and many people say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. For there you will teach us your ways and we shall walk in your paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord of Jerusalem. Judge therefore, Lord, between the nations and rebuke many people. We long to see swords beat into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. We pray in hope that nation will no longer lift up sword against nation, nor learn war anymore. We petition you this morning for our daily bread. Sustain us, Lord, only with those material things which we need to best serve you in this life. Give us neither poverty nor riches, but feed us with the food you have allotted for us, lest we be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest we be poor and steal and profane the name of our God. Cause us to resist the temptation to labor for the food which perishes. Rather, let us seek the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give us, because you have set your seal on him. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So as we come to the table this morning, we cry out, Lord Jesus, give us this bread always. You are the bread of life. We come to you that we shall never hunger, and we believe in you that we shall never thirst. We trust that all the Father has given you will come to you, and that the one who comes to you will by no means be cast out. Jesus, you are the living bread which came down from heaven. We have come to eat of this bread, that we will live forever. That bread which is your flesh, which you gave for the life of the world. For unless we eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink your blood, we have no life in us. For whoever eats your flesh and drinks your blood has eternal life. Christ Jesus, raise us up at the last day. For your flesh is food indeed, and your blood is drink indeed. O oh Lord Jesus, let us abide in you forever. As those who have confessed our sins and who have confessed Christ Jesus before you this morning, Father, we rejoice to hear again that it is by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves. Use this word to humble us, lest any of us should boast. Make us a humble people. Far too often we have sought to remove the speck from our brother's eye without first removing the plank from our own. Instead, we turn our hearts this morning, ask that, asking that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. We therefore pray for those civil rulers and authority over us. In your good providence, you have not raised an earthly king over us, but you have given us lefts or magistrates. So we pray this morning for the civil leaders in this place. Like our forefather Abraham, we dwell in a foreign country, waiting for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. But while we sojourn here, we ask the peace of this city where you have put us. We pray to you for it, for in its peace we will have peace. Therefore, we likewise petition, pray, and intercede for all men, knowing that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we pray for salvation and peace to come to our neighbors, beginning here in Five Forks and extending to Simpsonville, Greenville, Greer, Malden, Fountain Inn, Woodruff, and all of those cities and towns where our people live. Likewise, we pray for our missionary pastors and their congregations, in Albania, Switzerland, Belgium, Italy, England, Germany, Hungary, Indonesia, Okinawa, Kenya, Taiwan, Belize, Brazil, Haiti, Honduras, Peru, Tennessee, Virginia, Utah, everywhere these ministers preach, everywhere your people go, we pray for the success of the gospel. Protect these men, their families, their congregations, and all your people from apostasy. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. May it never be said that we were drawn away by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in to choke out the word. Rather, make us those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. 
Surely all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. We shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Holy Father, we pray this morning in the name of Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We come to you in his name, knowing that you have highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I ask you to take your Bibles once again and turn with me for our New Testament reading to 1 Thessalonians. We'll be reading verses 5 through 10. Let's stand once again to give honor to the reading of God's Word from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. There Paul writes, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to so remain standing, take your Psalter hymnals and turn to Psalm 16a. And we'll remain standing to sing, Preserve Me, O My God, Psalm 16a.
Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Jesus uses an analogy that cuts both ways. Men are fruit bearers of one kind or another, of evil or of good. As goes their heart, so goes their fruit. The Apostle Paul, when he was instructing a young pastor, Timothy, he said in similar fashion, he said in 1 Timothy 5, 24, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. His point is that sooner or later, people are going to reveal themselves. It is ultimately going to be revealed in judgment. But sometimes before then. And when great sin reveals itself, it is always a cause of mourning. But likewise, when great obedience, when righteousness reveals itself, it is a cause for celebration. We come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We find that Paul is continuing his celebration of righteousness manifest, of faith's testimony in the case of the Thessalonian church. What is happening with them is not ending merely in Paul's own personal happiness in the Thessalonian or the Thessalonican project, but he is rejoicing in the rejoicing that has gone on outside of their small kingdom into the larger kingdom of God. Their faith is reverberating throughout the whole world and it is a point of encouragement, of inspiration for the whole church and it is still benefiting us today. And so let's pray that the Lord would would show us that benefit, that we might learn from the example of this church. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we desire to be taught by your word. We know that we are so weak and poor in our understanding. We are so forgetful and we need to be reminded. We pray, Lord, today that as we listen carefully to what Paul has written to this church, what he has written about this church, that we might be instructed in our church and respond to you with faith and obedience for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Paul begins thinking through where he left off and and talking to us about the reason for his thanksgiving. And we saw this, if if we go back just a few verses, two through four, we read, Paul says, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and fa- our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election from God. And now, as he continues on in verse 5, he, he explains to us what is both before and after his giving of thanks. What is the, the cause that would stir up his reason to give thanks and how that is continuing to reverberate outward. He begins there using an interesting term. I hope you caught this. He says in verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only. That's an interesting thing to say. Our gospel as if in some way Paul has possession of the gospel. That, that he and Silvanus and Timothy, that somehow they had a particular version of the gospel that's different than, say, Matthew or James or, or, or someone else. But it's not the case that, that Paul is differentiating himself from any of the apostles. This is a shared faith, something that Paul likes to talk about, but he is differentiating from other Gospels. And he does it in a lot of different places. First Thessalonians 2.2, 2, he talks of the Gospel of God. He repeats it a couple more times in that chapter. First Thessalonians 3.2, he says the Gospel of Christ. Second Thessalonians 1.8, he says the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he wants to talk about a particular kind of Gospel that is, that is different from others. Turns out that they're competitor gospels there are there are other gospels that are out there in the world and there's one particular gospel that is in the face of everyone in Thessalonica that is the gospel of the emperor the emperor has the 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 empire is 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 filled with with different competitors to the true gospel but the one in particular began 63 years before the birth of our lord jesus birth not in Nazareth but somewhere else of a man named Gaius Octavius that history will come to know as the nephew of Julius Caesar who will be his adopted son and heir and is going to be the future Caesar Augustus. 
Caesar Augustus is the founder of the Roman Empire. He is the one that transformed Rome into something other than what it was before. He established the Pax Romana, the, the Roman peace, which transformed the ancient world. He was a big deal. One commentator writing about him says, The news of the transcendent event in the life of the emperor, as well as his decrees and discourses, was proclaimed throughout Italy and the provinces as the gospel. There's one famous inscription, I I, I shudder almost to read it, that speaks of Caesar Augustus. 9 BC, it is written of him and of his gospel. It says, pertaining to the day in which he was born and the day of his coming to power, it says it was a day which we may justly count as equivalent to the beginning of everything. If not in itself and in its own nature, at any rate, in the benefit it brings Inasmuch as it has restored the shape of everything that was failing and turning into misfortune and has given a new look to the universe at a time when it would gladly have welcomed destruction if Caesar had not been born to be the common blessing of all men. Whereas the providence which has ordered the whole of our life showing concern and zeal has ordered the most perfect consummation for human life by giving it to Augustus. By filling him with virtue for doing the work of a benefactor among men and by sending him, as it were, a savior for us and those who come after us to make wars to cease, to create order everywhere. And whereas the birthday of the God, meaning Augustus, was the beginning for the world of the glad tidings, the, even, the evangel, the gospel, that, I have come, that, that have come to men through him. The celebration of Caesar Augustus is is comparable to anything that you will read in Scripture about our Lord Jesus Christ. The praise sounds so familiar, just not the recipient. And when you hear those words, you hear blasphemy because you, you know the one true gospel, not this one. But this one was the prevailing gospel in the empire. This is what the Thessalonians had heard since their birth. This is what was continuing to resound throughout the, the, the empire among all those places where Paul is going with the gospel is there's already a gospel in place, the gospel, the gospel of Caesar Augustus. He was their savior. He had given them peace. He had restored them from what was failing and fallen and broken and, and fixed it all so it would seem. But the gospel which Paul preached, his gospel, when he says our gospel, his gospel is far more astounding than the gospel of Caesar Augustus. In the moment, yes, Caesar Augustus was more popular. He was more thought of. He was more revered. He was more honored in worship. But he was merely a pretender to the throne. He was doomed to diminish. His his retreat into the background was certain. He was going to be reduced to something unlike what would ever happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be reduced to a a matching question on a, a world history class. But Jesus is going to rise. He is, his kingdom is going to grow. It is going to spread to the ends of the earth. And Paul is going to be the vehicle for proclaiming that true gospel. Such as he will write in 1 Corinthians 15, 21, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in its own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are his at Christ's coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Paul was preaching a a victorious gospel, one that is going to transcend anything that they knew in any way that they knew it. One who could go so much further in his reach than, than Caesar Augustus ever could because he could not reach into the realm of the dead because he was already dead. Immortalize them as they tried to do. Instigate worship for for Caesar Augustus. It it would never succeed in the way that Christ would succeed because he rose himself from the dead. And so Paul preaches Christ's victory and he preaches his particular victory that takes place in Thessalonica. Among among the early conquests, they were one of those churches, one of those, those people who had been formed out of idolatry, brought into this marvelous faith. He says, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. The gospel had worked. It worked in the preacher and it worked in the people. Think about what had happened in Paul. He was, he, the gospel had enabled him to do what, what, what he had done. 
There was, there was certainly, there were the signs and wonders that were part of his ministry. He testifies to these in multiple places. Romans 15, he says, For I will not dare to speak to any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Again and again, he talks about the signs and the wonders and the mighty deeds of God. Those worked in the name of Christ that, that, that brought about this, this, this confirmation of the proclamation when he spoke the name of Jesus and called men to repentance so that they could, they could understand there was truly power there. In Acts 16, we, we read about, about his, his presence in Philippi and what happened when Paul cast out a demon of a slave girl who was, who was being who was being exploited and, and how, how, how God granted an earthquake to, to shake off the power and the bondage of the chains that, that Paul was in in prison. In Acts 17, when we read about the formation of the church in Thessalonica, we don't read of any particular miraculous works, but it doesn't mean that they weren't there, but certainly we know what was there. Turn back in your Bibles to Acts, Acts 17. We've looked at this passage before, but in this passage we see the, the founding of the church in Thessalonica in verses 1 through 9. It says there, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, was, uh, as his custom was, went to them. And for three Sabbaths, reason with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating or committing to them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. If you keep reading, you find out that even those who, who opposed them, talking about them, cried out and said, these men have turned the world upside down. They saw the unmistakable power of what the gospel does in transforming people's lives, taking their, their heart, their orientation, their direction, their drive, and pointing it in a completely different direction altogether. The gospel had, had power, and that power had worked in the congregation so that all the citizens in, in Thessalonica are having to contend with who is this man, Jesus Christ. And some of those citizens embraced by faith, they were, by the predestinating and electing grace of God, they were those who would become citizens of the, of the city above, who would know Christ by faith and know his salvation. And so they would be granted much assurance or supreme fullness at that truth. They knew that there, there was no greater truth to be possessed than the one that they had in Jesus Christ. It trumped all other truths. It's interesting, Paul reminds them as you go back to our passage in, in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5. He says, as you know what kind of men we were among you. He reminds them of the part that he played. And, and, you, and you might think that this is Paul bragging in some way about he ministered to them. But it's not the case. He's actually making little of himself as he does everywhere else. What kind of men was Paul when he was among them? Well, we know his testimony. Everywhere he goes, it's, it's clear what he is. First off, he is faithful. He proclaims the word. Think of, of his testimony to, to the church in Ephesus or the elders of Ephesus when he met with them in Acts 20, verse 27. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He told them all that he knew of Scripture. He proclaimed all that was, that was relevant and applicable and true to them as he could. He didn't hold back anything. It, it, no secrets, no, well, let me keep out the bad parts. He preached the suffering of Christ and the suffering of believers. He preached the blessings and he also preached the dangers. Part of his proclamation by his presence is that he was a servant. Paul is not ashamed to embrace the title of slave. He calls himself one in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ or a slave of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, he says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, he says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Paul owns the title and he lives the life so that he can say this everywhere he goes. And no one says, No, Paul, that's not true. Yeah, I remember how much money you took from all of us and how you were exploiting all these relationships. 
When he says he was a bondservant to all, when he, when he made himself a servant to so many, it was, they, they, could, they could bear witness to it. It was unchallenged wherever he went that such was the case. And the last thing you could say about, about Paul was that he was a sold-out representative. He believed the product that he was pitching. I don't know if you, any of you remember the old Hair Club for Men commercials. That, they're more relevant to me than some of you, but... Back in the day, there, were, there was a commercial, and they, and they advertised one of the, the, the great marketing geniuses of all time, Cy Sperling, the hair club for men. He, he gets on, and he talks about his product, and I don't even know what their product was. I doubt it could work on me. But at the end of the advertisement, he would close it out by saying, I'm not just the president, I'm also a client. He was a user of his own product, and then he flashes up a shiny, bald picture of himself, and then he see his glorious hair in the, in the, in the, in the commercial. But this is Paul. Paul Paul is not just a a paid informer of other people. He is someone who has owned and possessed the gospel for himself, and he knows how desperate he is for the truth of who Jesus is. So he spoke to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.12. He says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He knew that there was nowhere else to go but to Christ. Just as Peter said, you have the words of life, where else shall we go? And so Paul serves them out of conviction. He is, he is loyal to them in the church and in turn that they have they've rewarded that loyalty. Look at verse 6. Paul says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul is again giving thanks because of the the manifestation of their faith in their life as a church. The ESV says it, I think more usefully and more literally, it says you became imitators of us and of the Lord. It's not just a question of them following in in the same direction, but the fact that they 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 were showing the same pattern of life and the same experiences. Notice in verse six again, the middle part, what does it say? It says he, Having received the word, how? In much affliction. When they received the gospel, when when they believed the proclamation of who Jesus was, they believed to the saving of their their souls, but they also did so to imperiling their bodies. Is by embracing Christ by faith. They were inviting persecution. Their profession of faith, their profession of faith, their baptism. Their association with God's people, their participation in the Lord's Supper, their submission to his word and preaching, their publicly praising him. All of those things were, were, were flags that are saying, we are radically different. And we are not going to worship a false god. We're going to, sell it. We're going to separate ourselves from the idols of the nations and from, from all these things that are tied together with them in our culture. We're going to make ourselves as weird as we could possibly be. And that antagonized people. Not that they were antagonizing anyone. They weren't fomenting rebellion. They weren't trying to to, to do anything that that deserved what the civil magistrate would turn and do to them. It turns out it was simply the fears of an insecure government. When you have people who have power and and they see another threat, another rival that that rises up, that they they, they turn their attention against them. May it it ever make you such a good citizen to follow Christ, they don't care because of the exaltation of Christ, because they want to be exalted themselves. And they're threatened by the invisible reign of Jesus Christ. What he has, what he possesses, the loyalty that he deserves. And that's the folly of unbelief. That's what unbelief does. Think about Psalm 2. What, what does it say? Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They say, let us break their bond in pieces and cast away their cords from us. They don't want the law of God. They recognize that there is a king with a law who deserves loyalty and obedience. And they don't want that, and so they fight against it. Again, the psalmist in Psalm 14, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. But the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. And they have all turned aside. They have have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. 
have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord. There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. There's these, these fools in the world opposing Christ, fighting against him, and all the good that he does, unable to help themselves because they have turned aside altogether. That was true in the day of the psalmist. It was true in the day of the Thessalonians, and it's true in our day as well. People still oppose the spread of the kingdom, and persecution is still everywhere around us. And that would seem like a reason for despair, right? That if you come to Jesus, that you come to imitate Jesus in his suffering, you come to imitate Paul in his suffering, you would think this is, this is maybe not such a good decision. But keep reading. What does Paul say? Verse 6c, he says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit. Their suffering was a peculiar kind of suffering. The kind that's experienced exclusively by those who are in Christ. The joyful the suffering that has always been a part of the proclamation of the gospel from the very beginning. Matthew 5, this is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That same pattern, those who have gone before has suffered for identifying with Christ. It has been hurtful to them, and yet there is supposed to be joy that goes along with it because of the very thing that you are being identified with Christ. It becomes a matter of practice for the disciples. Acts 5, verse 40, after the, 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 the apostles are put on trial, and Gamaliel gives this advice that, well, maybe we shouldn't kill the followers of Christ, and they say, okay, we won't kill them, but here's what we will do. It says, they called for the apostles, and when they had beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Whew, I only got off with a beating. When was the last time any of you were beaten publicly for expressing your faith? And then what did they do in response to that? It says, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Peter explains this. He, he, he makes sense of this for us. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. He says that, that, that Christ suffered, and when we suffer for his name's sake, we are being identified all the more closely to him, which is the safest place that you can be. There's no better place to be than to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. However foolish you might look, however much pain you might endure to be in Christ is the only safe place for anybody in eternity. And that's why James can begin his letter with this ridiculous statement. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But that makes no sense in any other world but in the world which is true, which we live in, which is the one where God is Lord over all. And where Christ is his servant sent into the world to be our savior. And where those who look to him will live. The gospel makes sense of suffering. It tells us that it's meaningful, that it's useful, that it's helpful. And it's worth rejoicing in. And the Thessalonians got it. They were living in it. And, and, and Paul wanted to, them to know that what they had experienced in those early trials. From the very beginning and, and the trials that certainly followed after he left. And they continued to worship Christ. Is that... Not only was God watching, not only was Paul watching, but the whole world was watching. Look at verse 7. He said that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. He says that their faith, that it, it rang out. It's a word that has three possible meanings. All of them are great. It describes a thunderclap, something that is loud and unavoidable. It describes the shouting of a multitude, whether they're in celebration or whatever. And it also describes a rumor that spreads everywhere. All of these things were taking place. It, the, the gospel was breaking in in particular locations, and they were one of those locations where the gospel had broken in. And it was upsetting the world. 
No one could avoid it. It was going to come to you in one way or another. You had to be confronted with the gospel by, by witnessing what had happened among these people. Bree and Amphipolis are picking up on this as well as Corinth and Athens and eventually Rome and Jerusalem and the whole world are hearing about it. And guess what? We're still hearing about the Thessalonians today. It's part of our Holy Scriptures, our New Testament, that we read their story. We recognize the work that Christ had done and that there were people who heard and believed and were transformed. That's a good reminder for us is that our faith is not a private benefit. Sometimes we, we think that way. I kind of grew up thinking that way, is that I need to get my ticket out of hell and into heaven. And once I profess faith in Christ, I got my card punched. I can put that in my pocket, just make sure I've got it with me if I need it, and then I'm good to go from there then on. But that's not the picture that you're given by Paul when he's talking to this church or anywhere else in the New Testament. It says that what we have, what we believe, should show up. People ought to see that you belong to Christ. Paul tells us that there were historical rallies, rallies in terms of what happened to this, this, this congregation. There were their manifestations. There were evidence of their faith. First off, they were hospitable. Verse 9, he says, you know what, uh, what manner of entry we had to you? They practiced hospitality. They had received Paul when he came. And this has always been a mark of God's people from, from righteous Lot to the angels of Sodom, Rahab, Abigail to David, his men, the widow of Zarephath. All these people who receive the, the, these, these, these gospel testimonies about the salvation that's being offered by God. They embrace that. But, but also not only that they, they, they welcomed him into their presence and fed him and cared for him, but that they heard him. They received the word. That was the most hospitable welcome they could give was to believe what he had to say. And that was what they exercised, faith. And you're doing that to an extent as well. Again, sometimes we need to be reminded of the, that we are involved in bizarre rituals. Once a day, or, or once a week, we take one day out of the week and do radically different things than what the rest of the lost world does. We get dressed up nice. We go to extra efforts in the morning to look a little bit different than we do on other days of the week. We get up early on a day when no one else is doing that in order to come. And we come in and we, we fill this room with these loud noises and songs that are not exactly going to make the hit list. They're not burning up the charts, what we're singing in here. The people that you're with aren't likely to improve your reputation. The coffee in the fellowship is great, but not that great. There's a world of vastly more impressive, more talented more entertaining people, more indulgent things to go and do besides this. This is work to sit and to listen to a preacher and to, to, to sing these songs at the top of your voice, to stand up and sit down over and over in these hardback pews. All of that is a kind of work, but that is, that is a hospitality toward the word of God. You want to hear what's being proclaimed and you're rejoicing to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and his work. There was a physical welcome, but more importantly, there was a welcome to Paul in his word. And the response was that they repented of their idolatry. That was the second fact of their testimony, is that they broke from the traditions of their fathers. They separated themselves from their culture. They became obedient to the faith of the scriptures. He says, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Their lives did change. They did make a break from those, those idols and come to worship the invisible God. Clearly they had believed and they were persevering in the faith. The third fact about their testimony we see in verse 10 is that they were waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers from the wrath to come. They had taken on that Christian posture of expectation about the future, of saying, I believe Jesus died and that he rose again and that he's coming again. He's coming back and he's going to right every wrong. He's enthroned now. He's reigning now. His kingdom is growing now, but there's going to come a day where every wrong is going to be repaired. Every sinner is going to answer for his sin, and all those who believe in him are going to be vindicated. They're going to be forgiven, and they're going to be glorified into a place that they don't deserve. He is going to restore all those things that are broken in a way that Caesar Augustus could not even begin to attempt to try. Paul said to Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing 
of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what the Thessalonians were doing, and this is what we ought to be doing as well. Let's close with a few applications here this morning. One of those is looking back to that phrase of Paul for our gospel, reminding us that there are other gospels. We tend to think that there's only one because we hear the word gospel only in one context. The only time you're hearing the word gospel is here, right? In this building among these people. We have to be reminded the word gospel is just an old English word that means good news. And it's helpful to, to keep in mind that, that good news is something that we are constantly on the lookout for. We're seeking good news, we're pronouncing good news. And that's all well and good in its place so long as the, we don't have messianic expectations about a good news that doesn't have a true Messiah. Remember how Paul rebuked the Galatians? Galatians 1 6, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And he has a particular thing in mind that was true in that church in, or, or, or among the churches in Galatia. And we have to recognize that there are other gospels that are kind of at work around us, that are in competition. We have medical gospels, hopes that we have for deliverance from ills. We have technological gospels, things that are supposed to cure things that are broken and improve situations so radically that, that it changes everything. We have other kind of smaller gospels like marriages and graduation celebrations. Again, wonderful things in their place. Love technology, love medicine, love graduations and marriage. Those are all good things so long as they are kept in that context of recognizing that there is a giver of every good thing. And it's God, and there's only one Messiah that he gave. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ in whom salvation is to be found. Our gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has come. Just as Isaiah foretold, bringing with him peace and good things and salvation, those belong to him. Make sure that the gospel that you're holding on to, grabbing on to, that you are seeking after is that one that is declared in the Holy Scriptures, one which... Paul had proclaimed in that church and was proclaimed in every church is proclaimed in this church that Jesus Christ is Lord that he has come and that he has lived a perfect life and died a sinless death that sinners might be forgiven their sin and accepted in the beloved do you know this gospel in a few moments we'll be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and you have to know this gospel for no other allows you to come to the table and then the last reminder from this, this, this passage are the examples of faith. Remember Paul's dramatic and glorious salvation, his conversion experience where he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man. And God freed him from his sins, but it wasn't merely to get him into heaven. It was to free him to do work, to set him on the path of declaring the gospel in the most hostile of situations. He did become a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he, he did give himself over to that gospel proclamation as a genuine servant of the Lord to the public, an ambassador of Christ to the world. And he lived his life among men in that short time so that he could say, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. The Thessalonians knew Paul's life. They knew his unshakable faith. And they imitated it. They were followers of his pattern with Paul and Silas and Timothy and ultimately of the Lord by embracing the gospel and its consequences for good or evil. And they became an example to others within and without the church. Their testimony was clear. And this is what our testimony should look like. Jesus taught us by example. He, he set before us a pattern to follow. John 13, you know this passage well. He says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. What the Lord wants us to do is to follow him in his humility in his suffering, in his service to others, that which is demonstrated by Paul and that which goes on to be demonstrated by the church in Thessalonica is that they humbled themselves. Are you showing humility? Do you have something that someone can imitate in you that, 
that shows that you know that you are not Lord, but there is another, that you actually own the gospel of that proclamation of that great Savior. Would your wife say that you know humility? Or your children? Philippians 3, 17, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for a pattern in us. Paul is bragging about other people. He says, there are other people that you should be imitating. Are you one of those other people? Can children look at you and say, that's the way to go. That's what my life ought to look like. Do people see a happiness in you associated with Jesus Christ? There's some people that I know that have been around in my life that they, they so love Jesus that it spills out of them everywhere. They, they, they get into a road rage incident, not them, but someone else, and they just smile and they tell them about Jesus. Do you ever see anything like that in your life? Paul will go on and say this church in his second letter says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Do you go out of your way not to burden others, but to serve and to bless, to expend yourself so that others can benefit from you. The the motivation is clear. It is not to be an example, but it is to follow Christ that others may see following Christ. To live in light of what he's done and his coming, to identify with him and with everything that goes along with him, whatever the cost is for you in these basic ways of service or in the suffering that comes to those who follow Christ. May we now look in to Christ and look to identify with him as we come to the Lord's table. Corporately, we have, we have an opportunity to express our faith and how we live and what we testify to. But even in the Lord's Supper, individually, we have to own that. Because we, coming to this meal, you're making a personal declaration about your need, your dependence upon Christ. And so let's pray and let's ask the Lord, even now in these, these final moments before we come to the table, to prepare us to receive what he offers. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for having so great a Savior as we have in Jesus Christ who is worth suffering for. And may we now in these moments know his suffering for us. We may be instructed in our hearts. We may be enriched in our spirits. That our faith may be fed. We pray this in his name. Amen. As you come to a closer examination, you have a special help to you and the song that we're going to sing now will In just a moment, stand up and and sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. But listen to the first verse before we stand. Listen carefully to the words that will give your heart the right posture in coming to the table. O Sacred Head Now Wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. O Sacred Head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine. Yet though despised and gory, I joy to call thee mine. This is a time to rejoice, to call Jesus mine. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 336, O Sacred Head Now Wounded.
Please be seated. Again, as you heard a few moments ago from the Apostle Paul, he explained the Thessalonians' suffering by saying, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. This sacred meal reminds us of that truth, that Jesus has preceded us in his suffering and in his dying. Just as old and paschal lamb, hands were laid upon him, his body was handed over, forcibly taken, his blood was spilled, and he died for us. And on this day, we will not likely be imitators of the suffering of his persecution, but we are allowed to identify with him in his suffering and death. We make a public proclamation of our belief and our hope and our joy in what he's accomplished. This is an opportunity for us to tell the world, I belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to me. We can, with Paul and Philippians 3, 8 say, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That is the key to participating in this meal. Not that you happen to be here, not that a meal is being served, not that everyone around you is doing it, but this is for those who want to be found in Christ. You want to be fed by Christ. Listen again to the Apostle Paul when he says, warning us, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. This meal is not for those who are unbelieving, those who are ignorant, those who are unaccountable, and those who are unrepentant. It is for those who have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, who know their sin and thus their need for Jesus and are seeking to live for him. Those who come desiring what's offered here, who come looking for Christ, will find him. If your affection is for Christ, if you sincerely love him and believe in him, if you know him as your savior and your king, you're invited to come to this meal. It's not a, a Presbyterian table, it's the Lord's table. So if you're accountable, in good standing in an evangelical church, we welcome you to come. Hear now again those words of institution. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we ask you now that in these moments, by these simple elements, that you would sanctify what is here at this table, for the glorious purpose of declaring Christ to us. That we may know his righteousness, we may know the forgiveness which he provides by the blood and the body that were offered for us. Father, sanctify this bread, the fruit of the vine in this cup, to testify Jesus to our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples.
Jesus said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the abundance that you give to us in Christ. We thank you for his righteousness, that alone which can make us acceptable in your sight, that we might be considered holy because of Jesus. We pray now, now, Lord, that as we take the cup, that we would know the cleansing which only Christ can offer, the shedding of blood for our benefit, to know that it was spilt on the cross for people such as us, and we own it and accept it, even as we drink it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. After the same manner, our, our Savior also took the cup, and after giving thanks, as we've done in his name, he gave it to his disciples.
Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Lord God, we thank you for your electing love, for your regenerating power, for your adopting kindness, for your work in us. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to sustain us. Lord God, we pray that being fed by you, that we will live for you on this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's now respond by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals, and we'll turn to hymn number 278. We'll sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. At the same time, we'll take up a diaconal offering as those who have received much from the Lord to give back. Again, hymn number 278, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Let's stand together and sing. encourage you now to join us for a time of fellowship. Stick around for Sunday school class, especially the visitor Sunday school class happening in the back room back there. Uh, and then come back tonight at 6 p.m. Again, we'll close out the Lord's Day in worship. And also remember the Rioses as they depart, our beloved intern uh, hit, making their way to New York. Come back for that fellowship as well. Now receive the Lord's blessing and a benediction. Now, now may the God of peace sanctify you completely.
May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. He who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.